Oh, thank you. This is the Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is season six, episode 17 of The Chris Abraham Show. I think I'm gonna talk about nice guy syndrome and red pill and MGTOW and all that other fun stuff today and kind of maybe put up a uh, mirror to why nice guys are really some of the most toxic, dangerous, awful things in the world and why uh, being a nice guy is different than being Hey, hey, good, how are you? If I don't see you, happy Thanksgiving. And how being a nice person is super way different than being a nice guy. And being a nice guy is actually one of the biggest red flags. And in general, a woman will put you into the friend zone just because of your behavior. Because, you know, maybe if I don't see you guys, happy Thanksgiving. And, uh... It's not a joke. Like, I feel like women uh, know this as early as middle school. And uh, the main reason why, this is season six, episode 17. The main reason, TLDR, is because how can you trust someone who whose entire relationship with you is built on a lie, right? So what men call chads uh, are, they wear their intentions on their sleeves and uh, it's easy to, I don't know, anticipate outcome if you, if you see the cards of the person uh, across the table from you. And uh, women and people believe what you tell them. And if you tell them, I am your friend, we are friends, I just want to be friends, let's just hang out as friends, uh, that person's going to believe that you're their friend. And people, you know, generally aren't ever in their entire lives evolved enough to want to put or to be able to put all the eggs in one basket, right? I mean, let's think about the brazen sexuality of the teen years and the early 20s and the 20s and maybe even the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Uh, The kind of man that a woman desires that makes her tingle that makes her excited are decidedly in general with very few exceptions good people to invest in for the rest of your life but that doesn't dissuade you can't make someone get turned on by you you can't force them and i only have one example of a guy who was able to wear a girl down to where they married and they're still married today But I'll be honest with you, uh, the girl named Catherine was extremely hot, smart, beautiful, interesting, intelligent, gorgeous, but so was her friend Mike, right? So this wasn't like a homely, nice guy who has a funny sense of humor and wins on his charms. This was a nice guy who won in his charms and also was a freaking handsome dude. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the Lifetime movie generally doesn't have a homely person. But if you want someone as a, as a lover, as a girlfriend, as a wife, as a fiancé, you need to be honest about that as soon as it reaches the, um, uh, reaches, I guess, the crossroads or the why in the road or the fork in the road. Because I'll be honest with you, uh, outside of that one example I have, of uh, possibly, and you know, it's their story. They say it's like this, you know, where he just stayed around, stayed around, stayed around, stayed around, and eventually she looked at him and said, okay, and let's say that is your strategy. Now, the difference between being nice and being lovely and being kind and being gentle 
and being interested and being a friend and being friendly and being caring and being stable, um, the auditioning to become someone's raison d'être, to be someone's uh, l'amour est bien plus fort que nous, uh, l'amour finit toujours par triompher personne, is, is that it's not a bait and switch, right? You can't exert a charm offensive, and then the moment you, you know, shoot your, whatever they call it, shoot your, shoot your shot, the moment that happens, you can't all of a sudden become a raging lunatic and call that person who you've decided to try to win over through being sweet, gentle, kind, and so forth. You can't just turn around and call her a bitch or call her the C word or, or call her a lesbian or, or say awful things like, I didn't want you anyway, or you're fugly, or uh, I could do better, or no, nobody's going to love you like I love you, or any of that stuff, right? So one of the reasons in the like red pill, black pill, uh, incel community, one of the things they really hate is this, uh, I guess the term is like testing or whatever, like, but the, the theory here is that a woman is going to kind of diss you to kind of test you. But I mean, it's only normal, right? Like, like even animal owners like to figure out whether or not their animal is, uh, is potentially dangerous, you know, uh, by going ahead and creating situations where uh, the natural behavior, the fight or flight response or the fear response or the being cornered response or whatever like the 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 most popular joke in women's comedy is um you know all that men lose all that men lose when they go on a date is a hundred dollars but uh what women could lose on a bad date is their entire life because men can kill them so that's a funny haha joke it's it's more like a hmm you're right joke and if you're going to invest yourself in someone who's longer and more committed than a roll in the hay. Roll, roll, roll in the hay. Roll, roll, roll in the hay. Roll, roll, roll in the hay. Hey. Then you need to, uh, what is it called in my cardiologist office? You need to stress test the partner. You need to stress test them. And, you know, if you knew that men who call you their friend need to doubly be stress tested, right? You know, you need to see where the line is based be, uh instead of just seeing where the where the person you're spending your time with very vulnerable intimate times you need to kind of stress test that and uh and you know uh see if out of nowhere the person who has told you that men and women can be friends and that you're besties for life and that no one in the world knows you like he does but he just wants the the agape, not the eros. Um, he he needs to be doubly stress tested because uh, if he freaks out and says that you're a tease and you're a cock tease and how dare you lead me on like this? I've put my best time of my life and you just lead me on. I mean, those are human feelings, but those are dangerous feelings. And unfortunately, based on the human mind works, the moment a man does that to a woman, it collapses every single thing that you've ever said to her, every single thing that you've said up to that moment has been a lie. There might be examples of kindness and gentleness and honesty and openness, but that was just one of those strategies that a con man does uh, uh, or a spy does in order to build intimacy with you, right? So my spooky, my spooky friend uh, started to give me a bunch of like uh, pieces of advice he learned when he had to deal with the entire world of false names. And uh, he said that in order for a false name uh, and for an alias to work, you get to choose your own. He liked to choose obscure generals from, uh, from World War I and World War II. But you also need a backstory that is as uh, close to your real life. Like, for example, I live in Virginia. So maybe I would say that I'm from North Carolina or I'm from Maryland or I'm from... Pennsylvania, because I've spent a lot of time there, uh, or New York City, even if I, you know, very familiar, or even Washington, D.C., because that's where I spent, you know, 
uh, 10 years or more of my life. So I don't know. Uh, so you need, if you're going to do a con or if you're going to be a spook with a false name, you need to make sure that you have your uh, story as close to the truth and as close to your heart as you can. So, so if you find out that the person you've spent the last six months with or a year with and you've confessed to him about all the lovers you had and talked to him about all the boyfriends you had and, and felt like you are super duper close and intimate and you know me more than my boyfriend knows me. You know me more than my boyfriends know me. You know, I feel like having you in my life makes it easier, quote unquote, for me to go out and meet hot men and have sexual encounters. Because when it comes to stability, Mike or Joe or Harry, you complete me. But, you know, not attracted to you. You don't make me tingle. The moment he is like, that's enough. I've invested more than enough. You owe me or, you know, any such thing, any such freak out. The entire Jenga castle collapses. Now, I'm not saying for you to go ahead and build a better Jenga castle. I'm saying that uh, you should really only be friends with women you want to be friends with. And you should uh, be honest with women you want to date. Be willing to receive the rejection. Get the rejection. Get the formal rejection after you take a shot. And then you decide whether or not you will feel comfortable with the shame and humiliation, if that's what you're feeling, or if uh, you took your shot, now you can just move on to be friends because uh, it's not about you retreating and then preparing for another attack. It's you conceding that there just isn't any chemistry from her point of view to you. Now, I personally do not believe uh, that men and women can't be friends because I've got such a specific limitation on women that I am attracted to that 99% of all women are not attractive to me and the other 1% aren't attracted to me. So I can easily enjoy the world of deep friendships with uh, men, women, non-binary, trans, all races, all creeds, all sexualities, all genders, because uh, I do not I do not, I am not attracted to a commoditization of women. I'm not attracted to, uh, I'm attracted to a very specific type, but that very specific type is always changing too. So if I meet you and all of a sudden I go, what? Then you're my type from now on until I wander to someone else who makes me go, what? And then she's my type. So anyway, uh, yeah. It's better, ah. and if you have the stamina and you are enough of a sociopath to emulate being a very best friend and you are kind and sweet and loving uh, and caring and attentive and really you were just suffering because this desperate sexual and emotional and heartfelt love that you have, but you're not having any sex with her um, and you're just completely platonic friends, and you can maintain that for 30 years, then you know what you're actually being? You're actually being a kind, gentle, loving, supportive, intimate person uh, who's just complex, right? Like, as long as you never betray that trust, that attention, you allow your deep, your deep sadness and humiliation and, 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 and as long as you keep your unhappiness to yourself and protect the person you love, then that's actual love. However, the moment your plans are dashed, and you turn into a complete psycho, uh, that wasn't love at all. That was, that, was, that was what we call nice guy syndrome. Nice guy syndrome isn't, I mean, I've seen some ugly guys and some short guys and some lonely guys and some fat guys and some autistic guys and some uh, neurotic guys and some bald guys and some balding guys and some, you know, chinless guys and jawless guys and neckless guys and I've seen them have amazing sex lives and get married and so forth. The nice guy syndrome is a syndrome. It's not the result of being a nerd or being a dork or whatever. The nice guy syndrome is that toxic feeling that you need to trick or fool or lie to a girl. And I'm not talking about short game. Short game 
hey baby, I'm a lawyer and I'm badass and it's 11 o'clock at night and uh, everything I'm telling you is a lie because I'm trying to get you in bed because I'm in a singles bar and donate the game, beat the player, donate the player, eat the game and all this stuff. That's different, right? That's, uh, that's called, that's still toxic, but it's called seduction, right? It's called, um, uh, there's an entire, like an entire pickup culture. And these people who are in a pickup culture take it extremely seriously to the point where they'll go and get a PhD in neurolinguistic programming and psychology so as to more efficiently bed the babes. I'm talking about this commitment to, I guess, Stanislavski method where you, like Sartre in bad faith, commit to an act of being the best friend to a girl that you're hoping at some point, like, like in some sort of bizarro world, opposite world, where there's a romantic comedy, where instead of the guy friend, this is not your story. The story is the dorky girl with her hair up in glasses with no makeup, being friends with the guy she desires, and then... According to the story, she, uh, she, what? She scores a, a date as friends to the homecoming game, homecoming dance. And the night before, her guy friend, who's obviously in love with her, and a bunch of her female friends let down her hair, take off her glasses, put her in a, put her in a little black dress or a gown, throw on some strappy heels, and hey, voila, the man falls for her. That nice guy syndrome is when you are a man, but you are playing a role of the dorky girl in the romantic comedy who one day hopes the boy will notice her. Doesn't work that way uh, the other way around. So nice guy syndrome is actually an extremely dangerous thing to be, thing to have. And women are extremely more afraid of being psychoed and killed by a so-called betrayed, how dare you, I can't freaking believe it, I thought we were in love, psycho, cutting her up and throwing her a dumpster than she is about what might happen if, you know, if some guy, like, you know, sleeps with her overnight and anything else like that, right? Like, so, anyway, I hope this was useful. This is season six, episode 17, and I don't know if this is helpful. I generally give terrible advice, and I'm generally a garbage person, so aloha, mahalo, and I'll talk to you soon. Ciao. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.